Thank, thanks very much for coming out, folks. It's a great turnout. And thanks to Aaron and the team for organising this. Can everybody hear me up the back all right? Can you understand a real southern accent? <laughs> a genuine one? Look, if I say anything that you don't understand, just put your hand up and let me know. We do have a different jargon down there. <laughs> Look, um, thanks very much. As, as Aaron said, I've, I've been touring the States now for about the last three years. I come on 90-day visas, travel all around the place. I'm very tempted to stay for 91 days because apparently I get a free cell phone and health, health care and <laughs> this sort of stuff. What a great country, <laughs> no? So, everybody always says to me, so why do you care about the United States? And I say there are two basic reasons. The first is simple gratitude. You know, my country was only saved in World War II from invasion by the Japanese, by the huge sacrifice of your fathers and uncles and grandfathers at Guadalcanal and the Coral Sea and Midway. And that memory is very strong in my country today. Thank you. The other reason is related but a little more selfish. You know, Ronald Reagan had it right. This is the last best hope for mankind. If freedom should fail in the United States, if you lose your constitution and your liberty and your economy and your military superiority, all of which are in grave danger. The bad guys of this planet, I'm talking Russia and China and Iran and Cuba and Nicaragua and Venezuela and North Korea and their Islamic allies, they will carve up this planet amongst themselves. I get emails all the time from people saying to me, look, if things turn bad, can we come and live in New Zealand? And I say, look, come down for a visit, you'll love it. It's an amazing country. It's beautiful. The climate's just like Northern California almost. But it isn't a refuge, you know, no, nowhere is now. You know, just 1,500 miles to the north of us lie the beautiful Fijian Islands. Wonderful tourist destination, but the Chinese are now training the Fijian military. They're building big hydro dams on the islands. Tonga is almost, always, almost a Chinese client state, as are many others around the South Pacific now. The Chinese are moving in big time. The Australian Minister of Defence, and if you're not sure, Australia is a small island off our west coast, okay? <laughs> the Australian Minister of Defence was up in China for talks about a year or two ago, and a top Chinese general publicly embarrassed him he said, Australia needs a godfather. The question is, will it be an American godfather or a Chinese godfather? If you are smart, you will choose China because we are the growing power in the region. Now, he wouldn't have been cocky enough to say that under Bush, even under Clinton, certainly not under Reagan, but he's cocky enough to say it now because he sees the leadership coming out of your White House. And all around this planet, folks, your allies from Israel to Germany to Britain to Canada, Japan, South Korea, Australia, they're all freaking out. They're so worried because they see that your president seems to love the bad guys a lot more than he loves the good guys. That's causing huge instability, folks. Israel, which now has no friends left in the region at all because of the meddling of your president, may be forced to take desperate measures to defend themselves, and those measures could put us into World War III. Japan was never supposed to rearm after World War II, and now it is, and that doesn't please us in Australia and New Zealand. But we don't really blame them because we understand that they cannot trust Obama to protect them from North Korea and China. So you've got a president who cries peace all the time. He's got a Nobel Peace Prize in his trophy cabinet. <laughs> Yet he has abandoned Reagan's doctrine of peace through strength. And if you abandon your strength, folks, you lose your peace very soon afterwards. 
That is the lesson of history. And no one has done more to undermine your military and alienate your allies than this current president. You saw where this was going when your president called for help to go into Syria. All your allies were lining up, right? Couldn't wait to get on board, could they? I'm not saying they should have. One country. I'm not saying they should have. It was madness. But that shows where American prestige is going. You know, Vladimir Putin, the old KGB man, and as he says himself, there's no such thing as, a, as an ex-KGB man. He spent most of his life trying to destroy your country, is now regarded as more of a statesman on the world stage than the so-called leader of the free world. You know, your allies look at America, they saw what Obama did to Poland and Czechoslovakia, took away their missile shield, basically abandoned them to the Russians. They saw what he did to Georgia, let the Russians take that. They see what he's doing to Israel every day. They see him doing nothing to help the Venezuelans who are trying to throw off the Cubans. They saw him doing nothing to help the Iranians who tried to stage a genuine anti-Mullah revolution a couple of years ago. Obama stood back. They see what he does, see what he did to Egypt, basically nearly destroyed an ally there. And they look at the Ukraine right now. Your country has a military treaty to protect the Ukrainians in the event of Russian invasion. The Ukrainians gave up their nuclear weapons in exchange for that promise. And what's Obama doing to help them? He's sending out John Kerry. <laughs> what's Kerry going to do? Threaten to cut off their ketchup supplies. That'll terrify Vladimir, won't it? So you look at the world right now, folks. The world economy is teetering on the brink all over the world, teetering. Russia is expanding, trying to reclaim the old Soviet empire. China is building a blue water navy. The Iranians are getting increasingly aggressive. China controls most of Africa. The communists control most of South America, including Brazil. Everything's heading towards a big, big blow up, folks. And this is the time to cut your military, right? Obama is cutting and slashing and burning your military like crazy, driving the good people out. You know, the gay policy, that's not designed to help homosexuals. That's designed to destroy the morale in your military. Same with women in combat. So you've got a president who's basically destroying your military before your eyes and alienating your allies while the bad guys of the world are getting bolder and bolder. Where's that heading, folks? Obama wants to cut your nukes to 265 nuclear weapons. The Russians alone have more than 6,000 that we know about, and God knows how many that we don't. But they would never use them against you, would they? Or threaten you with them, because they're your friends now, right? They're just a regional power, according to Mr. Obama. You've got to remember, Obama worked with pro-Soviet communists his entire life, from Alice Palmer in Chicago, the woman who got him his first job in politics, a Soviet agent, Frank Marshall Davis, pretty much a Soviet agent, Quentin Young. All these people put Obama into where he is today. And their, their goal was to destroy the United States military, because they knew if they could do that, their friends would rule this planet. The most significant thing your president said in his entire first term of office when he was caught off mic in South Korea with Dmitry Medvedev, the then Russian president, when I get re-elected, Mr. Medvedev, I'll have more flexibility to deal with you. Yes, said Medvedev, I understand. I will pass your message on to Vladimir. We are with you. What more of a warning do you need, America? How much more blatant does it need to get? Now, I've had put two books out. Unfortunately, my first book isn't here. That was Barack Obama and the Enemies Within. 700 pages detailing Obama's ties to pro-Soviet Marxists, communists, radical terrorists, etc. 
And I'll tell you what, 700 pages, folks. They got bloody heavy lugging around the country, I can tell you. And I got sick of it. And I vowed and declared that my next book would be smaller and lighter. <laughs> and this one is the, is the enemies within, communists, socialists and progressives in the US Congress. And guess what? It's bigger. Because <laughs> those bloody commies just kept on coming, folks. The deeper I dug, the more I found. And I couldn't leave out Nancy Pelosi or Barbara Lee or Barbara Boxer or Mark Tucano or, John, or Miller, you know, the whole lot. California's got more than anybody in the book, I have to tell you. That'll shock you, won't it? Surprise you. Now, the book, the book is really about the two big secrets of modern communism. And the first secret, I think they borrowed from the devil. Because we all know that the cleverest thing the devil ever did was to convince people he doesn't exist. What have the communists done in the last 20 years, folks? They don't exist, right? Or well, if they do, they're no longer a threat, are they? The second big secret of modern communism directly contradicts the first. Now, of all the books written on communism, the thousands of books, hardly anybody has ever touched on this. The big secret of modern communism is the ability of tiny Marxist-Leninist parties, maybe only a few hundred comrades strong, to influence and even control the legislative process in their country. In other words, to write the laws of the land. Now think about this, you know, what, so what I'm saying is less than 20,000 card-carrying communists in your country are writing the legislation that rules the lives of 300 million people. A little bit far-fetched, isn't it? Very small tail wagging a very big dog. But and when these people stand for public office under their own name, which they do occasionally for fun, they get sort of 67 votes or 83 votes or something, and people laugh at them. But is it just the number of votes you can get, is that the only thing that determines your level of political influence? How many votes did Al Capone ever get in Chicago? How many votes did the mob ever get in Las Vegas? Bribery, corruption, intimidation, vote fraud, indoctrination, thuggery, blackmail. There's a whole bunch of ways that small organised groups can control much larger groups from behind the scenes. And that's what Leninism is, folks. It is the science of small groups taking power and holding power. Forget the Marxism, that doesn't work. But the Leninism does, people. Lenin led less than 2,000 Bolsheviks to take over Russia in 1917, a country of 140 million people at the time. It's always been a tiny minority. There have never been popular revolutions, folks. And they've had 100 years to get better and better and better at it. Now, the mechanism they use in most Western countries, including this one, is control of the labour movement. Now you say, so what? You know, the unions are 11, 12 per cent of the workforce. But think about this. How many elected Democrats at any level in this country do not owe their job to the labour unions? They need them, folks. They need them for money, for manpower, get out the vote, even for vote fraud. The unions do it for them, people. And if the unions give you a job and they can take away your job and they tell you to promote a certain piece of legislation, what do you do? You do what you're told, right? So the process is quite simple. The communists set a policy. And I'll just say, you were very lucky in this country for a long time because your unions were controlled by hardcore anti-communists like Lane Kirkland and George Meany. But in 1995, there was a coup. That was the year that Democratic Socialists of America, your largest Marxist group, 7,000 members, Gramsciist communists, that was the year they took over the AFL-CIO. 
They got rid of Lane Kirkland and put their man, John Sweeney, in as president. And now their protege, Richard Trumka, does the job for them. They took over every major labour union, folks, SEIU, ASCME, NEA, United Auto Workers, the whole lot. They own them. And that gives them leverage, folks, because as I say, if they give you, you're a Democrat and they give you your job and you tell them, they tell you what to do, you do it. So it's very simple. The communists set a policy. It might be socialisation of student loans or green jobs or normalisation of relations with Cuba. They then make it union policy and the unions make it Democrat policy. There's hardly a policy in today's Democratic Party that cannot be traced directly back to Democratic Socialists of America or the Communist Party USA or both. That's how they're controlling the agenda, folks. That's why you have a centre-right electorate and you've had centre-left governments for decades. Because the unions control the Democrats and the Communists control the unions. It's very simple. And that's why the last 15 years, since 1995, the Democrats have been purged of all their centrists. The Joe Liebermans, the Dixiecrats, they're all gone. The unions purged them. All you've got left are socialists and yes men and women. That's it. And it's a real shame that a lot of the modern Democrats, who are basically patriotic people, still think they're voting for JFK or Harry Truman, neither of whom would have a chance in today's Democratic Party. Both of them would probably be amongst you guys. So... This is all academic, so how about some examples of how this actually works in practice? I want to start with, I'll give you a couple, I want to start with one. If you've been following the news lately, you've probably heard of it. It's called Obamacare. <laughs> Good to see you keeping up. Okay. Now look, I acknowledge that Obamacare is not yet fully single payer or socialised medicine. Single payer mean the government pays all the bills. But we all know where it's going. Harry Reid's admitted it. Jan Schakowsky said so. This is going to single payer, folks. Now, I come from a country that's had single payer my entire life. And I'll tell you what, people, it sucks. Everything you've ever heard about it is true. But I still get some people, even some Republicans will say to me, Oh, look, the uninsured, the pre-existing conditions. You know, this is sort of fairer. It'll be OK once it settles down. It's not really socialism. The people will get a good fair turn at this. The big word all the advocates of this forget is the word quality. And is there any more important word when it comes to your health care? Quality counts, folks. And they all assume quality is going to stay the same. But think about it this way. If you're in a free market healthcare system, you are a customer. How do you business folk in the room, how do you treat your customers? Pretty darn good, I hope. Else you won't be able to afford to buy my book, I tell you. <laughs> but you do, you take them golfing, you give them Christmas cards, right? You know, you look after them because they're your lifeblood. And if you're a doctor, your patient is your, is your customer. And the longer your patient lives and they're happier and healthier and more product, productive they are, the more holidays they can afford to give you, like, give you, right? That's how it works. But what if you're in a single payer system? The government pays all the bills. Sounds great to a lot of people. Sounds wonderful. But think about it this way. The budget is going to be fixed. You're going to have X budget per year for healthcare set by the government. But the needs are unlimited. Health needs are unlimited. So fixed budget, unlimited needs. What do you then become? You become a liability, folks. You're a liability on the system. They can't make any money out of you. You're only a liability. There's no profit there. So what... You business people in the room, what do you do with your liabilities? Business 101, right? Eliminate your liabilities. 
Now I get people say to me, oh look, under Obamacare, we might have death panels, you know, like groups who decide who's gonna live and die. You don't need death panels. Every Western hospital outside your country, every head of every cardiology department and renal department and oncology department is his own death panel. Think about, you know, Say you're the head of the oncology department at Christchurch Public Hospital in New Zealand, where I come from. You've got a budget of say $20 million a year for chemotherapy. You've got a 75 year old guy in this bed who's dying of prostate cancer. You can give him $200,000 worth of chemo and extend his life two, three, maybe five years. You've got a seven year old girl in this bed with leukemia. You can give her $200,000 worth of chemo and extend her life 20, 30, 50, 60 years. She might marry, have children, have a career. It's the end of the financial year, folks. Your budget's running out. There's no more. You can only afford to treat one of them. What are you gonna do? Is it hard to figure out? What would anybody do? We don't, we don't talk about rationing in my country. We just know that if you're old and not paying taxes and you're a, a useless eater, <laughs> you know, you know, harsh term, isn't it? That's how they think. You do not get the same level of treatment as someone who's young and productive and in the prime of their life. Same if you're too young, because they haven't invested in you yet. That's how it works in Australia, folks. That's how it works in Canada and Europe. But it's going to be different here, right? Because the laws of economics don't apply here, do they? Look, fixed budget, fixed budget, unlimited needs. What can you do but ration and triage? You have to decide every day who gets treated and who doesn't. There's no profit there, it's only liability. That's all it is. Would you rather be someone's profit or someone's liability, folks? Not hard to figure out, is it? We print our own money. <laughs> exactly. That's something, you know. And, uh, It's tried and true, isn't it? <laughs> Worked great in Zimbabwe and Weimar, Germany. <laughs> Look, the, the father of the single payer healthcare movement in this, if that man had said that in a Democrat meeting, they'd say, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the father of the single payer healthcare movement in this country is a man called Quentin Young. He's pushing 90 now. He's a retired physician from Chicago. And in my darker moments, I often wish he'd gone to live in Canada 20 years ago. So he probably wouldn't be with us now. But he is. And he's been trying to wreck the world's greatest healthcare system for 50 years. It's his life's work. He set up Physicians for a National Health Plan. He's worked with the AMA, worked with Canadian doctors and worked with several congressmen like John Conyers to get single payer legislation in front of your Congress several times. But it always got voted down. But finally in 2009 with the Affordable Health Care Act they started to make progress. And it's not surprising the progress came under Mr Obama because for many years in Chicago, Quentin Young was Mr. Obama's personal physician and friend and political mentor. He claims credit for indoctrinating Obama into socialized healthcare, says Obama was a huge fan of single payer when he was an Illinois state senator and nobody paid any attention to him. Quentin Young was a 40 year veteran of the Communist Party USA. Any Vietnam veterans in the room? Thank you, I knew there'd be several, thank you. In 1972,
Quentin Young and three other doctors went to North Vietnam and offered their services to the communist government when they were trying to kill people in this room, folks. That's how patriotic Quentin Young is. He went on to join Democratic Socialists of America, your largest Marxist group, and they are the people behind Obamacare. They've been pushing this 40 years as their number one priority. 40 years. They had people on Hillary Clinton's health panels in the 90s when they tried to get single payer then. They've been pushing this through the AFL-CIO, which they control, through Physicians for a National Health Plan, which they set up with the Communist Party, and through the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which they also set up, and that's 80 members of your house. The biggest caucus set up by Democratic Socialists of America. That's their way of getting their legislation into your house. And to prove, and right now they are boasting in their publications that Obamacare is going to fail. Obamacare is going to fail, folks. But that's great. That's great to them because that means then they're going to blame the greedy doctors and the greedy insurance companies and single payer comes next. That's the plan. Just before the last election, the, Romney, the Obama campaign put out a little video designed to mock Mitt Romney. They said, hey Mitt, guess what? You know how you um, don't like Obamacare? Well, the joke's on you, Mitt, because the man who designed it for us, the architect of it, their words, that was John McDonough, former Massachusetts state legislator, Harvard academic. He designed it for us, Mitt, and guess what? He also designed, designed Romney Care, so ha ha. And it's true. McDonough did design both systems. What the video didn't say is that John McDonough was the Boston chairman of Democratic Socialists of America. So a Marxist designed Obamacare. The same Marxist group promoted it through the Progressive Caucus and the AFL CIO. And another member of the same group personally indoctrinated your president into it. You think they might have had some influence, folks? 7,000 members, and they're on the verge of socialising between one-sixth and one-quarter of your economy and wrecking the world's greatest healthcare system and possibly consigning people in this room to an early death. You going to let them do it, folks? No. Damn right you're not. You can still stop this and you have to stop it. Now, the other example I want to use, and this hasn't quite got through yet either, it's been held up so far, and that is comprehensive immigration reform, otherwise known as amnesty. Should resonate in this state. Now, you've got people in the Republican Party telling you this is going to be good for the GOP, right? Because if you give the 12 million illegals, 20 million, 30 million, however many there are, if you give them citizenship and voting rights, they're all going to be so grateful, they're all going to start ticking those R's, right? Just delusional. You know, 90% of the black population in this country has been voting Democrat for 60 years now. No matter what the Democrats do to, to degrade and enslave their communities, they still keep ticking those D's. 80% of the Jewish population has been voting Democrat for more than 100 years. No matter what Obama does to Israel, they still keep ticking those Ds. It ain't easy to get people to change. A lot of the Latinos who are the bulk of the illegals are socially conservative. They may change 20, 30, 40 years. We got two and a half years, folks. We got two and a half years to give us a chance of saving this country. It ain't going to happen in two and a half years. So why do these Republicans tell you this garbage? John McCain and Lindsey Graham and John Boehner and Eric Cantor and all your favourites. Could it be in any way related to the fact that the US Chamber of Commerce has spent more than $1.7 billion promoting amnesty in the last 10 years? What do you think the Chamber wants out of it, folks? Ain't hard to figure out, is it? Cheap labour to pick their watermelons and pluck their chickens and work in their hotels. 
because their prophets, folks, in their mind come before your border integrity or your national security or the laws of your land. That's how patriotic they are. And could, I being, could it be possible that the Republicans who are most openly pushing this are the ones most closely connected to the Chamber of Commerce and big agribusiness? Or am I being a little bit over-conspiratorial? But this started with the far left people and it started right here in this state, a bit further south, but this is where it started. Back in the 1950s, there was a Communist Party member here in Los Angeles called Bert Corona. He was also a Democrat and he set up the Viva Kennedy Clubs, the first organised effort to bring Latinos into the Democratic Party. He also set up, mainly on government and union money, a whole network of immigrants, illegal immigrant support networks right across the Southwest and Southern California. And the purpose of these groups was to encourage illegals across the border, get them work in the factories and farms, get them eventual citizenship and voting rights. The voting was key, deliberate, very deliberate. Now this Bert Corona, he um, trained hundreds of disciples to carry on his work, mainly on government money. And three of them are very prominent today and you'll know all of their names. The first one, they all work very closely together. They've, they've changed your state, folks. The first one is Antonio Villagarosa, until who recently was the mayor of Los Angeles, a Communist Party supporter for decades. He turned Los Angeles into a sanctuary city and the illegals flooded in, changed the entire demographics of the whole area. The second member of this little group, another Communist Party supporter, Gil Cedillo, until recently the head of the California State Senate. Big time immigration activist. He is the one who got the DREAM Act pushed through a couple of years ago. They gave all sorts of so-called rights to the children of undocumented workers. Another member of this little group, another Marxist, the most powerful woman in your state, in my opinion, Maria Elena Durazzo, head of the California AFL-CIO. She is the one behind the massive union-driven Latino voter registration drives and get out the vote efforts that over the last 15 years have added hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Latino voters to the California rolls. Almost all Democrats. That has changed the voting patterns of the entire state. Orange County, once the most conservative county in the United States, is now purple because of their work. California, which was once a reddish, purplish state, is now solidly blue. All as a result of the work of deliberate fostering of illegal immigration and Latino voter registration. Deliberate plan by the Marxists. Absolutely deliberate. And you all see the effects of it every day. Go to Arizona. There's a man died there in 2012. Very successful politician, but I bet you've never heard of him. His, his name was Lorenzo Torres. He was the head of the Communist Party USA's Latino Commission. He worked very closely with Bert Corona to set up immigrant support networks from Texas to Arizona, New Mexico to Nevada, Colorado, right across the Southwest. Same thing to get the people over the border, citizenship and voting. He also was in charge of organising any, all the attempts, any time anybody tried to crack down on illegal immigration, Lorenzo Torres would organise the demonstrations against it. He did the big ones against SB 1070 in Arizona a couple of years ago. And thanks to the Tea Party, he was beaten. He had suffered a rare defeat. Therese also set up the movement in, in Tucson and Phoenix, which gave Arizona, one of the reddest states in the union, three Communist Party supporters and their congressional delegation. Raul Grijalva, Ed Pastor, and the freshman Kirsten Cinema. Three Communist Party supporters and their delegation, folks. 
all done by Lorenzo Torres and his comrades. The man who's driving this now, and he worked in California for a while in the 90s with the SEIU, his name is Alisao Medina. And you would have seen him on TV wearing a purple shirt, leading an immigration rally. He is the man who got the bill through your Senate this year. He drove it. He also is using his union comrades, because until recently he was the, one of the heads of the SEIU union, the largest, the largest union in your country and the one with the biggest Latino membership. He's been using his union guys to demonstrate outside the offices of Republican congressmen all over this country, including around here, to get them to flip their votes on immigration, to get a bill through the House. Medina is a member of Democratic Socialists of America. He's a supporter of the Communist Party USA and a former member of Obama's Latino Advisory Commission. He was consulted by Mr Obama just before Obama embarked on the latest push for immigration reform. Our Medina also works very closely with Raul Grijalva on immigration issues and with Luis Gutierrez, the rep from Illinois, who is driving this through the House of Representatives. Gutierrez is a former member of the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, a pro-Cuban Marxist-Leninist outfit. Now, to, to labour the point, which organisation 20 years ago was leading the charge in this country against, against illegal immigration? Which organisation was constantly lobbying Congress to increase penalties on any employer caught employing illegal immigrants? So unions, folks. It was the AFL-CIO, because they saw that Illegal immigrants were unfair competition for union members and would drive wages and conditions down and cost jobs. Very logical. 2014, which organisation is leading the charge to legalise illegal immigrants? The unions, the AFL-CIO. So why was it bad for union workers 20 years ago and good for union workers now? The fact is it isn't. The fact is, before 1995, the AFL-CIO was there to represent the interests of its workers. After 1995, when they were taken over by Democratic Socialists of America, they became there to promote socialist revolution. And illegal immigrants are real bad for union workers, folks, but they're bloody great for socialist revolution. The AFL-CIO is happy to sell out the wages and conditions of its own members because the revolution comes first, folks. And it ain't easy to get union members to vote against their own interests. It took Alisao Medina, the Marxist from Democratic Socialists of America, five years of work to get them to flip their policy at their big convention in 2000 in Louisiana from anti-illegal immigrant to pro-illegal immigrant. The Marxists did it, folks. Got them to flip. So why does Medina want this? What's the big deal? So he's working full time on it, into the White House all the time. Medina let the cat out of the bag at a big progressive conference in Washington DC two years ago. He got up in front of the comrades and said this, passing an immigration bill is the number one priority of the progressive movement. We have to get citizenship and voting rights for our 11 million undocumented workers. And did he talk about compassion or reuniting families or giving immigrants a break or the American dream? Not a single word, folks. All he said was this, in 2008, Latinos voted overwhelmingly for Obama and progressive candidates. If we stand by these people and get them citizenship and voting rights, they will stand by our movement. That will give us at least 8 million more Democratic Party votes. That will give us a governing majority, not just for the next few election cycles, but for the foreseeable future. In other words, forever. In other words, a democratic one-party state controlled by the communists and the socialists. Because you think about it, the Democrats get eight million more votes, Texas goes blue. The Southwest goes blue. 
You take the electoral college votes from Texas, your second most popular state, and add them to those of California, your most popular state, which they've already got through immigration, it makes it mathematically impossible for the Republicans to ever elect another president. Cannot be done, folks. It's gone. Democratic one-party state at that point. And if you think the Democrats are arrogant now, you imagine what they'd be like with eight million more votes in their pockets and the Republicans permanently out of office. Wouldn't just be the IRS they send after you people. This won't be like France or Germany. This would be like Venezuela very quickly and Cuba not long after, because that is the plan. And you have Republicans, folks, telling you this is good for the GOP. They are not only betraying their own party, people, they are betraying their country for the filthy lucre. That's all it is. And you folks have the power to primary them, and if you value your country, that's what you have to do. Because the traitors aren't just on the left, folks. Now, the other thing the book is about is the individuals. I profile 51 members of the House and 14 senators with identifiable ties to hardcore Marxist anti-American groups. Now, anybody in this room not counting military, and I won't take no for an answer in California, anybody in this room ever applied for a federal government job who's willing to admit it? <laughs> Come on. Okay. Okay. Did you need an FBI security clearance? Oh, I work for an elected official. So that's oh, okay. Okay. Now, no, this actually for the federal government D directly. Yes, sir. Did you need an FBI security clearance, sir? Yes, I had a class two clearance to work for government stuff for building the space shuttle. And right. Well, you'd certainly need it for that. But even the lowly level jobs, you need a clearance of some kind. And they can go through your underwear drawers, you know. They check your family background, relatives, they check your education, drug habits, overseas travel. Sorry? 40 years. Yeah, 40 years. Look, I had a friend recently who applied for a federal government job, not that high a level. The FBI drove to Canada to interview his communist uncle. And on the strength of that, he was denied that position. And fair enough. Because you're working for the heart of the free world, folks. You're working in the federal government. You might have the ability to influence public policy someday. You might be guarding state secrets or the president or a nuclear facility. They need to be able to trust you because America has enemies, folks. But what happens if you're a young radical who hangs around with the Communist Party like George Miller or Barbara Lee or... Eddie Bernice Johnson or Danny Davis or Jan Schakowsky or Patty Murray or any one of the several dozen I could name. And they, you hang around with the communists and they control the local unions and the local Democratic Party and they can put a suit and tie on you and get you elected to Congress or the Senate and you can serve on the Homeland Security Committee or the Science and Technology Committee or the Armed Services Committee or even the Intelligence Committee, and have access to all sorts of government secrets and the ability to influence public policy in all sorts of directions. How much of an FBI security clearance do you need for that one, folks? Zero. Because the people are supposed to vet the candidates, right? And the media are supposed to help you do it, right? How's that one working out for you guys? Look, they did it with Sarah Palin and Mitt Romney. We knew about Mitt Romney supposedly beating up some young gay kid when he was 17. Like, that was important, right? We knew all about Sarah Palin's kids' Facebook pages and Twitter accounts, because that was important, right? Because you need to know about them, because they might be leading your country someday. So why don't you need to know about the elephant's graveyard of skeletons in Mr Obama's closet? Or Barbara Boxer's? or any of dozens of Democrats I could name. Why is that different, people? Could it be the media isn't on your side? That'll surprise you, I'm sure. 
So you're, you're at John Conyers, you know, 40 year history with the Communist Party, no, 50, 50 year history with the Communist Party USA, leader of you, your, your Judiciary Committee for years, the, the committee that writes your legislation. You got Rosa DeLauro, one of the top Democrats in this country, who's got an office in the headquarters of the Connecticut Communist Party. Liaises works all the time with Joel Fishman, one of the top communists in this country, and the comrade delegated by the Communist Party with liaising with the Democrats, the daughter-in-law of a Soviet spy, by the way. You got Jim McDermott out of Washington State, long time history with the Communist Party, went to Iraq just before the Iraq war on a fact-finding mission. Then he came out campaigning against the war. Then it was revealed that that mission was paid for by Saddam Hussein's intelligence services. And he still works with the communists right now. Got Patty Murray from Washington State, long time history with the Communist Party. Peter DeFazio in Upper Oregon, long time history with the communists again. Eddie Bernice Johnson, Sheila Jackson Lee, Danny Davis, Barbara Lee, Nancy Pelosi, all communists connected. All of them. You know, I've been around libraries in this country for five years, folks. I've dug through communist publications for years, thousands of them. It's all there, if you care to look. You've got, you got Danny Davis, you've got Jan Schakowsky, Jerry Nadler, all card-carrying members of Democratic Socialists of America while serving in your Congress. But they're working for you, right? They're upholding the Constitution, right? Think back to that Vietnam War just for a minute. You, you veterans in the room, did you lose that war in the jungles of Vietnam? You won every battle. You lost that war in your Congress because you had people in your Congress who were defunding the Vietnamese military and doing everything they could to tie your hand behind your back. You weren't allowed to bomb North Vietnam, just like the rules of engagement in Afghanistan today. You were handicapped all the way and that cost you the war. Well, those Democrats who did that, folks, just happened to be closely affiliated to the Communist Party USA, which was closely affiliated to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which was basically the father party to the Communist Party of North Vietnam. Those people in your Congress were working for your enemy against your troops in the field. And how many of them paid any penalty for that, folks? One of them, Secretary of State. So this has been going on for a while, people. You got Judy Chu down in California, down in Los, Los Angeles way. Chinese lady, looks like butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. Beautiful haircut, lovely clothes, on Obama's re-election committee head of the Progressive Caucus, head of the Asia Pacific Caucus, which is affiliated to Leland Lee's little outfit, by the way. That'll surprise you. All of those Asia Pacific Caucus people are all tied up with the Chi Chinese communists and the gangsters. All of them, not just Leland Yi. Warren Furutani, the whole lot. You know, but um, Judy Chu goes to China all the time to build business ties between China and California. When she's in China, she says, I'm coming home. The Chinese press has described her as China's representative in your Congress. Go back to 1979, Greensboro, North Carolina. The Communist Workers' Party, a hardcore Maoist outfit, got in a pro-Chinese, got in a street gun battle in broad daylight with the KKK. Automatic weapons were used in broad daylight in the streets. Five people died. Pretty extreme, don't you think? Judy Chu used to head one of their major fronts, one of the main Communist Workers' Party fronts. She's worked with them for years. She is still working with at least five leaders of the Communist, former leaders of the Communist Workers' Party right now. One of them helped her to set up the Asia Pacific Caucus in your Congress. Right now, you have members of the Congressional Black Caucus, including Barbara Lee and Maxine Waters, who go down to Cuba on a regular basis to confer with the Castro brothers. And while they're there, Raul Castro boasts about this, I quote him in my book, 
He talks about how they talk with him, how they're going to change policy in your Congress to ease trade and travel restrictions on Cuba. So basically they can send more spies and terrorists to your country. What do you call it, folks, when someone goes from your country to an enemy country to work with them against you? Is there a penalty for that, folks? Yes. Well, you wouldn't think so, would you? Because it happens every damn day. It's been happening in your Congress for decades, folks, and it's gotten worse in the last 10 years. There's at, least 50, there's at least 100 members of your House of Representatives and 20 members of your Senate who wouldn't get a basic security clearance to clean the toilets at any military base in your country. And neither would your president. Could that be a bit of an issue? No, do you think your enemies don't use that against you? They did in the Vietnam War. Do you not think they're doing it now? Do you think those Iranian and Cuban and Nicaraguan and Russian and Chinese intelligence agents, agents all around your country who have friends in your communist parties and your unions aren't using their influence through your congressmen against you? Do you think they'll be stupid enough not to take advantage of that glaring hole in your national security? You think they're really that dumb? They're doing it every day, folks. It's a lot of the reason why your country is in trouble. But I don't want to depress you people with any of that or, <laughs> or bring you down in any way. Am I too late? Just hang around a bit, please. Look, look. If I thought there was no hope for America, I'd be back in my beautiful New Zealand right now building bunkers and stocking up on baked beans. Okay? <laughs> And I'm not mocking prepping, believe me. But this is how I see it. 2008, the left thought they had a slam dunk. They had the House, they had the Senate, they had their man in the White House, and their agenda was all written out, folks. 40 years of work, all those 60s revolutionaries who've been burrowing, the Bill Ayers and the Bernadine Dawns, who've been burrowing away through your unions, through your Democratic Party, through your universities and your media, Finally, their ducks were all in a row. And they were going to take out middle America once and for all, folks. They were going to squeeze out the middle class and bring socialism to America. And who was going to stop them? John Boehner? But that's it. That's the thing I'm coming to. Because in 2009 and 2010, something miraculous happened. And I do not use that word lightly. You guys happened, folks. You guys, you came out of nowhere. I didn't see you coming. You came out of left field, or should I say right field. <laughs> and you blogged and you marched and you emailed and you rallied and you agitated and you phone banked and you put some spine into that GOP and you, you took that back that house in 2010. And that historic victory, you did it folks. Exactly. But think about the implications of that. Look, folks, that brought the agenda of the left to a grinding, screeching halt. They had it in the bag, folks. 40 years of hard work. It was all ready to go, all written out. No one was going to stop them. And you guys snuck up on them. A bunch of amateurs and novices snuck up on them from nowhere and took their toys away. And some of you wonder why they hate you. <laughs> you seriously do not understand why they call you dirty names. <coughs> Folks, you took it off them. You saved your country. Do you see that? You saved your country because had you not done that, in 2010, the entire agenda of the left would be in now. Obamacare would be locked in. Those 8 million illegals would be voting in this election. Cap and trade, card check, everything, green jobs, every scam under the sun would be in now. And where would you go then, folks? You saved your country, people. You saved it, and you have to realise that. And if anything deserves a huge pat on the back, a bunch of amateurs saving their country in its time of need, 
what else could? What else does, people? If you don't see it, there are millions of people around this world who do. You saved your country. You gave it another chance. Now, I'm, what you did also even better, you helped to start the second American Revolution. You, the 912s, Glenn Beck, whatever. The education you have done and the inspiring you've done. There are more people in this country now who actually read the Constitution, understand it, the Bill of Rights, the separation of powers, all the things that make you different. There are more people like you than there ever have been. Way more than the last hundred years, folks. I've been to the bluest of the bluest states. I've spoken to 38 of the 57 states, people. Just checking you're awake, right? I haven't found some of them yet. But look, you might have the 51st if you keep going. And there might be a couple of senators out of this room amongst you. But look, you know, I've Massachusetts, Michigan, you know, those blue, blue states, I've had huge meetings in those states. There are people in every, in all the country areas around this country, there are millions of people who think like you now. Millions. And that wasn't there five years ago. You have done so much. And you've fought back Common Core, you've fought back Agenda 21, you've taken over school boards and county commissions, you've taken over GOPs all over this country, you've given us a whole bunch of great people, you have put spine into state legislatures all over this country, folks. And now they're giving the finger to the federal government. Is that important? Yeah. It's hugely important. Michigan is a right to work state because of people like you. Michigan. Can you believe that one? So you have done so much. But sometimes I think, and I'm giving you both barrels tonight, by the way. I'm not holding back at all. We did everything. Sometimes I think you're a bit like baby Superman. You do not understand your own strength. You know that that immigration bill would have gone through the House this session had they not been terrified of what you did to Marco Rubio and are about to do to Lindsey Graham. They understand your power, folks. They do. Look, I was at, I'll tell you another thing. I was at a big progressive conference last year in Washington, D.C. I went to the Institute for Policy Studies 50th anniversary bash. They are all there, people, all people out of my book. And I, it's, you know, this, this is the, the, the ideas factory of the Obama administration, the most senior progressive group in the country. They used to work with the KGB in the 80s. Now they work with the Cubans, hardcore people. And I paid my 75 bucks and I put on my little name tag and I mingled with the Marxists, folks because I wanted to know what they were thinking, or know what their agendas were, what they, what they were planning, what their ideas were. And after a while, people, it didn't take long, I got bored. I got bored stiff. Because all they talked about all day was one thing. Tea party this, tea party that, tea party this, tea party that. They took the state legislature's office. They snuck up on us. How do we let this happen? Why didn't we see it coming? What are we going to do about it? They're standing in our way. We've got to do all this work all over again. Tea party, tea party, tea party all day long, folks. Seriously, if you don't understand your strength, your enemies do. Because they know you are the only thing standing between them and what they want. Seriously, people. Now I'm going to do something now that's normally considered very bad manners, okay? But I'm a Kiwi and I can go home, okay? Because you don't go into someone else's country, do you, and tell them how to do things, how to run their government, do you? It's like telling your neighbour how to do their decor. Well, look, and that's what I'm here. Look, the, my only value to you is as an outside observer, because you can often see your, own, your, your neighbour's problems better than they can see their own. And I see a movement five years in, a lot of betrayals, some losses, some victories, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of burnt out people, 
Are we making a difference? Should we persevere? What's the right course of action? It's hard work, folks. It is hard, thankless work. Very hard. You all know that. I don't have to tell you. So where do you go now? This is my view from an outsider, and I hope you'll find it of some value. Right now, you've got to undo 100 years of progressivism. Might take 20, 30 years. Who knows how long it'll take. But you've got two huge battles coming up, folks. You've got 2014 and 2016. And if they win those fights and they get their illegal immigrant votes out of it, you might not have much, whatever you do after that might not count for much, people. They'll have such a huge majority. So you have to win. You absolutely have to win. And you've got very little time to do it. Now, realistically, in the time frame we have left, there is only one force, like it or not, that can stop the Democrats in that time, and that is the GOP. Now, I'm no shill for the GOP, folks. John Boehner and Carl Rover are right up on my dartboard, believe me. So there's only one force that can stop them, though. But their really important question is this. What will the character of that GOP be? Because if the old guard have their way, the John Boehners have their way, they'll give you a Jeb Bush or a Chris Christie, and you will lose, folks. And even if you fluke a win by some miracle, you still lose because progressivism just rolls on. But if you had a real leader, a real leader, maybe someone like a Ted Cruz, things could be very different, right? Now I'm going to go back in history, and you should feel this example, back to 1976. You've been losing your freedoms, Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, for decades. And people had nowhere to go. They were sick of it, but they had nowhere to go. But that year, a man came out of your state with a very different vision. And he talked about a shining city on the hill and peace through strength and the Constitution and liberty and rebuilding America. The things you stand for, folks. And hundreds of thousands of people got behind Ronald Reagan and rallied to the flag, people. They were inspired by what he had to say. And they pushed him and pushed him to get that Republican nomination in 1976. And what did the GOP old guard do, folks? Those old Rockefeller Republicans. They trashed him. They hated him. They slandered him, sabotaged him. He was forbidden, Ronald Reagan was forbidden to speak in Ohio, people. Forbidden by the state party. That's how much they loved Ronald Reagan and the GOP. And they beat him that year, just beat him. They gave Gerald Ford the nomination and Gerald Ford went up against Jimmy Carter and Carter won. And how did those Carter years work out for you guys? Still paying for it, guys. Interest rates up to here. Gas queues round the corner. Panama, Iran. Your second worst ever president, folks. But the really important point is this. The most important thing I'll say tonight. The grassroots did not give up. They stuck the course. They got into that GOP, took over the precinct positions at every level they could. They got organised, disciplined and focused. And in 1980, they were not going to take no for an answer. They got behind Reagan again, and this time they forced the GOP to give them their candidate. Forced them. And Reagan went on to take the country in a landslide. The hostages were back the first day, folks. The interest rates went down, the taxes went down, the prices went down, the economy boomed, he rebuilt your military, he restored your pride in your country and he took down the Soviet Union without firing a shot. Any better president than the 20th century people? And why did you have the Reagan revolution because people like you got organised and bypassed the GOP old guard. Is there a lesson there? Now, I just want to digress for a tiny minute. Because I'm told, you know, often we talk, 
always people saying, we've got to get more young people involved in the movement. And Republicans will tell me this, more young people. I say, well, how do you do that? We've got to get more young, cool, hip candidates, nice haircuts, nice suits, smooth talkers, liberal, few liberal values, people like Marco Rubio. Because that's who the young people love, right? I say utter crap. You know? It's just garbage. You look at, give you an example, that man out of Texas, Ron Paul. Now, I don't agree with Ron on a couple of issues, but I'll tell you what, I know where his fan base is. Look at the colleges, people. The young people love him like a chocolate. Thousands, they go, thousands turn up to his rallies. And he's hip and cool and charismatic and liberal values, right? You know, he's a grumpy old bugger, you know, but he's a principled grumpy old bugger and he doesn't back down. He stands up for the constitution and never compromises. He's always consistent, always principled and always honest. And the young people love him like a chocolate, folks. And what was Ronald Reagan like, folks? Much the same, right? He wasn't young, he wasn't young at all, and the young rallied in their hundreds of thousands for him. He converted hundreds of thousands of young college liberals into conservatives. Some of them are probably in this room now. He did a huge amount to change this country. Got all those Reagan Democrats across. I go around this country, I wear my Ronald Reagan badge at airports quite often. I've had 16 year old girls with wacky looking goth haircuts come up to me and say, wasn't he great? How do you think I'd get on with a Gerald Ford badge? <laughs> Not quite the same. Look, right now, folks, this country is Carter on steroids, right? And you need Reagan on steroids to turn this around. Not just to do what Reagan did, to go way beyond Reagan, to actually gut the federal government and restore your constitution. That's what you need, people. See, Reagan built the base. He had the social conservatives, the defence conservatives, the fiscal conservatives. He got them all together in one tent. And that tent has never been the same since. So right now, you've got a fractured base. To win the next election, you need every single element of your base because you've got vote fraud against you, you've got the media against you, your demographics moving the wrong way. You need every element of your base. You need those 1.2 Liber million libertarians who gave their vote to Gary Johnson. You need the social conservatives and the fiscal conservatives and the defence conservatives and the Second Amendment people and the education voters and the energy voters and the moderates. And you need the two million Republicans who stayed home last time. And I'll tell you who else you need. You need the several million, nobody knows how many, evangelical Christians who don't even vote. But how are you going to get them, folks? Because a lot of these people don't like each other very much. A lot of division amongst these groups. The one thing they have in common, though, is they all want something. Something inspires them. Every one of them has a pet issue, as I'm sure every one of you does. Whether it's Common Core or the Second Amendment or Federal Reserve or whatever, everybody's got something. So this is what I'd be doing if I was a man like Ted Cruz. I'd want to build that Reagan base now and get a run up quick before Jeb Bush gets ahead of steam up. Okay, so I'd be going out to these groups now and talking to them. I'd say the first thing, if you come behind me this time, and he's gonna put out a big petition very shortly to draft him. If you support me this time, the first thing that's gonna happen is Alan West will be on my VP ticket now. And for you libertarians, I want your vote. I'm gonna make Rand Paul Secretary of the Treasury and he could do what he damn well wants to the Federal Reserve and the IRS, carte blanche.
And you energy voters, Sarah Palin, Secretary of Energy. Drill, baby, drill. Drill in your backyard if you want to. Keystone Pipeline. $2 a gallon gas for every American family. Scott Walker, Secretary of Labor. Right to work all over, folks. John Bolton, Secretary of State. Build bridges to your friends, tell your enemies where to get off. <laughs> Ambassador to the United Nations, no one. <laughs> Dr. Ben Carson, Secretary of Health and Human Services. <laughs> Attorney General, Mark Levin. And for the Christians who don't care about politics, but they do care about the education of your children, vote for me this time. David Barton will be Secretary of Education. <laughs> Common Core's gone, your homeschooling rights are protected. Now, would you rally to a team like that, folks? Yeah. Yeah, Go across the whole team, you could fill every position. But you think about it. Would that unify the base? Because yes. everybody's getting something, right? Yes. Everybody's got someone to inspire them. Yes. And a team is far more powerful than one individual. Because yes. right now you put all your eggs in one basket and they can demonise a Mitt Romney or a Sarah Palin. But you try demonising 10 or 15 right wheelers campaigning across this country who are all backing each other up and don't take any crap from anyone. What would the left do with that, folks? What would the media do? They'd freak. The money would flow, people. The volunteers would flow in their hundreds and thousands of millions for a team like that. And you have never had a bigger base, folks. You have never had a bigger base in this country. You put the base together with the leaders who are there right now. Who's going to stop you? Who would stand in your way? So it's possible, folks. It's really possible. And this has been done before. You didn't just have a founding father, people. You didn't just have George Washington. You had a founding family. You had Samuel Adams and Benjamin Franklin and Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. You had a whole team then for that first American Revolution. If you have a whole team for that second American Revolution, no one's going to stop you, people. You'll get what you want. So what I'm asking for is two and a half more years at least out of you. You've done five years of this hard, hard work. I don't know how hard it is. But two and a half more years is going to decide the fate of not just this country, but the entire Western world. And if you do nothing, you know the result, people. But if you do something... If you work your butts off for two and a half years, the very least, and I cannot guarantee victory, but the very least I can guarantee you is the right to look your children in the eye and say, I did everything I could. But what is that worth to you? And if you win, and you can win, you will give your children not just the great country you inherited, but one even better. And what is that worth to you? Everything, folks. Two and a half more years. Have you got that in you? Yes. Yeah. Damn right. <laughs> now, I know it's tough. I know there's a lot of other distractions in life. But just to give a comparison, I was up in Morristown, New Jersey late last year. And I went to the to the encampment where 10,000 of your troops spent the winter of 1780. And that one made this one look like Tahiti, folks. That was hard. 10,000 troops started the winter. Death, desertion and disease took 4,000 of them. They weren't paid for months. 
The troops were raiding the, far the local farms to steal whatever they could. The troops were eating, boiling up their own boots to eat the leather. The officers were eating their pet dogs. Yet they got through that winter and they got through Valley Forge and all the other hard winters for year after year after year. They were chased across virtually every state, lost far more battles than they ever won. They were counted out many times, folks. George Washington was about to toss the towel in. But they staged a surprise attack at Yorktown, turned the whole war. And look at the country they gave you, folks. Look at the amazing country they created because they hung on and they persevered and they did not give up. George Washington understood how miraculous his victories were, folks. He understood that he had help. Uh, is the age of miracles over? If you stand up for the greatest country in the world, will you get help? Absolutely, people. You can count on that. So there is your choice. Stand up or not stand up. Now, look at it, you know, a bunch of farmers and lawyers and shopkeepers and seamstresses, you know, fishermen, labourers, took on the greatest military empire the world has ever known, had ever known to that point, and against all the odds, they beat them. And look what they gave you. Do you think those patriots freezing and starving at Morristown and Valley Forge had any idea of the amazing country they were creating? Do think they had any conception? They had stoicism and they had leadership, but that's all they had. But they persevered. Do you think they understood their place in history? Dodging British bullets and eating berries in the snow? Well, what is your place in history, folks? We can see their place in history because we have 200 years of perspective. We can look back. What about you looking forward? Look forward 200 years from now, folks. Some young kid will be up in front of a high school in this town, in front of a civics class, and he'll say to his friends, guess what, guys, I've just, something I've discovered that's blown me away. I'm amazed. You know how we studied that second American Revolution? You know how the patriots stood up against all the odds and they took back this country and restored the Constitution? We can see what we owe them. Well, I found out, I did some research into my background, my family. I found out that my great, 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 great grandma and granddaddy, they were in the Reading Tea Party, folks. <laughs> How cool is that? So I just want to say to you folks, thank you so much for what you're doing for America, for my country, and for liberty. God bless America, and God bless the Reading Tea Party. Thank you.